Mr. Chris, go and run, go and run them off me, please. Thank you. 
situation is to drain it. Because we have to put drive and good values on the students to allow them to put them to drive the car and, and then they will have to tell them that uh, every one of them who takes the internet that at the end you have to pay back this money because you are doing the reason. So right now they are so, so, so they drive the car with all the things and lights and stuff like that. Okay. No way. $1,200. Right, so if you said that I get, a, get money for the $2,000, $2,000. Right, <laughs> so then it would have been on the YouTube contract. He would be on the, if he gives me, yes, you want to say, they crash the car and they were trying to claim on the car. Right. So they, in, so, so they fly almost one year, but they realize they can't clear. But it cannot cover because it is $2,000 and the old fee. How is that covered? You understand what I say? It's $2,000 much? You can't cover own the property yet and it's still our property. So it is, it is deep. No, we spoke, I spoke to him sometimes when I told him that I needed that money. But the car is driving, wait, 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 you told him that the car is driving and driving. And what do you say? Well, if you have to bring it inside, you have a license. I told you. So what is he doing? So we take it off the road. What we, what, what I'm saying, what is worth in the world? So here what happened. If I said that anybody who's driving a car and his license, they need to bring the car in because all you can get is it's just a license. To bring it in. So they got to see out there. So did you tell me you have to do with it because you don't have a license? Because are you beating your car this that you get so blue? You said that you are calling and telling you have to bring the car and have to the license. It's just. Yeah. Because. Because they. they, they. So, but this is not what you tell me now. The car needs to be like it is set. And if you could drive it and they drive it and they get in trouble or whatever with it, it is like they don't blame us. But we cannot, if we must say, bring in the car so that we can get it like when it's set. And once they have the car driving, we can't be paying no more money. The last person to be paying no more money. No, 
You have to you have to go touch base with the by phone locker, but you can't receive it, right? Hold me. You see, turn on. Uh, so, so the only thing I want you to say is, right, is that TV is Um, let the record show we have a quorum present and uh, the meeting is called back to order and I'll invite the Deputy Sergeant at Arms to bring in the witness. I, Samuel Rose, do solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give this Honorable Legislative Assembly shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. We would 
Good afternoon, Mr. Rose, and let me take the opportunity to thank you for finding the time and your busy schedule to attend the Public Accounts Committee meeting. As you will have been made aware, this afternoon we're dealing with the efficiency and effectiveness of the Utility Regulation and Competition Office, and you have, you have constitutional responsibility, I think, under your subjects, so we look forward to an interactive session with you, sir. Um, you know the rules, the first time you ask a question, just state your full name and your position, that's just for the hands art. Um, I guess I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll start off with some, some friendly questions. Um, <laughs> The, the, I think it is fair to say that in addition to this report by the Auditor General, that the public's perception, and especially the perception of the members of the Legislative Assembly who are not in the executive branch, are concerned that we don't believe off-reg is achieving its objectives, um, so much so that you would have been aware, and I think it was the last finance committee, there was an effort to defund the off-reg, therefore close it down. Can you tell us how the government plans to address that perception in, in the public? Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, my name is Samuel Rose. I'm the Cabinet Secretary. And thank you for your very kind welcome and for starting off with such an easy question. <laughs> it is obviously no, we would not be taking tales out of school or it's no surprise as anyone, uh, to anyone in the public that Off-Reg has had its teething pains. I do believe that uh, with the arrival of the new CEO um, and, of course, with further clarity around the, the board, you know, we have recently um, reappointed the chair. Uh, on top of that, there are a number of ongoing matters that the cabinet has made it very clear to Off-Reg from time to time that should be the areas of focus and priority. In fact, going back as far as 2018, May of 2018, um, from the outset, it was fraught with challenges. Uh, the premise under which Off-Reg was created was to, well, amongst other things, to create a super regulator, but also to create efficiencies. And that's obviously the theme of this, this report, to seek efficiencies. Quite early on, it was evident that with the merging of the two statutory authorities, and of course then the removal from the uh, central government of the CPI and placing that into Off-Reg, that the starting premise of this now achieving, you know, uh, doing the same regulation for, quote, unquote, a lesser cost, if you want to just put it very basically, was going to be a bit difficult. They would obviously present um, their regulatory plan or, you know, in the sense of, um, the, the, some of the costs that would be uh, necessary to, for instance, regulate the fuels market. That precipitated an equity injection and an increase in appropriations um, of a million dollars, actually an increase of 1.15 to output URC 8 in order to fund the fuel sector. And the reason for that choice of funding the output as opposed to 
allowing them to charge that directly to their licensees was to obviously an effort to absorb or to prevent the licensees, because we all know what happened. You pass that on to licensees, what are they going to do with that, that cost? They're going to pass that on to the, the consumer, the end user. And so, you know, the cabinet has, the government has had a policy of no new taxes or fees unless there is a requisite new service being offered. In essence, we couldn't look at the public and say, well, because we created off-reg, we need to give, we, they need to charge the licensees an additional amount of money. And so the decision was made to fund that output directly. And so immediately after that, one of the riders, a, a rider was issued with the approval for that funding. And I'm gonna read that rider for the, and this is a correspondence with the then Chief Executive Officer, if I may have your permission, Mr. Chair. It said, um, the cabinet issued the following riders with approval of the funding. Official travel must be reduced. Greater focus should be placed on core tasks, specifically fuel regulation, fiber optics, and water licensing. All and best efforts must be undertaken to expeditiously complete the license negotiations with Cayman Water Company. Those are very clear, very clear um, guidance being issued because the government is obviously aware of what is of concern to the public, to the consumers. And so they wanted energy and efforts to be focused on those very important matters. Now, the government, as you, you will understand from a governance perspective, the governance around a statutory authority is, is very important, um, especially one that is a regulator and an independent regulator. And I took the opportunity to read a, a bit further the Auditor General's report references um, OECD guidance on regulatory practice. And it notes that independent regulators are referees of markets. Um, they have to balance between public authorities, the private sector, and users and consumers. So it's a juggling act. So Offreg doesn't have a doesn't have an easy task, and and we didn't set them up to have an easy task. It's a it's a challenging. The, the very nature of their work is exceedingly challenging. And of course, their role is to guide and protect, and to support our critical national infrastructure. All those things that I mentioned just now in that rider are critical national infrastructure, our water, our fuels, and our, our um, ICT connectivity, fiber optics. So we have to ensure a balance between due and undue influence over their work. And so I believe that the government is going to continue. Well, the government is going to continue to insist, because there's no one else to manage the negotiation of these these agreements and to deal with the licensees and, and what have you. And so we, you know, again, more recently, further from time to time, further directions are are, are being issued to Offreg in terms of things that they need to do um, to, with uh, with specific sectors. And so they're going to keep a very close eye on things while not crossing that line of, of blurring independence because, again, you don't want to ever do anything that is going to bring into question, uh, you know, government's not trying to seek a specific outcome as it relates to a specific licensee. They can't, that's to be determined by the negotiating process. But we can't have negotiating processes that, that have no end. But I guess the question that comes immediately to mind is why would Cabinet reappoint the board with such blatant ignorance of their directives? Because the evidence we have, and, and certainly the report bears out, none of those things that you just talked about have been achieved by off -reg. Well, we've had a change in board members, you know, our, our process is a very unique process in the public service. There's no, there's no process for identifying board members like this in the civil service, or across the public sector, I should say. Um, 
you yourself, Mr. Chair, will be very aware of that process as you would have nominated an individual to serve on the, the nominating committee. Um, and if, funny enough, ironically enough, that same OECD report speaks to, to um, the importance of a nomination process rather than appoint, you know, direct appointments. Ultimately, the cabinet makes the final decision. But we've had some changes on the board, and, and I believe that we have a, a, a board capable of, of helping to guide and, and drive things forward. But the other point I think we need to, to bear in mind is that we now have a new CEO. There was a, there was a period in time in which there was a, how can I say, a, a leadership gap there. And, you know, I, I do recall, for instance, uh, as you will know, one of the, I think I should point out, the record should show that um, as it relates to my own role vis-a-vis -vis the board, this is a board for which the cabinet office, in fact, no chief officer, the chief officer with responsibility for ICT or infrastructure, or the chief officer with responsibility for water, none of the sectors or n none of the public services represented at all on the board. Now, a number of other boards will have a, an ex officio role, maybe one, two, or three ex officio roles on their um, on the statutory authorities board, but that doesn't exist there. So that makes that that creates an even further distance from central government, and I think perhaps some things get lost in that distance. So you know they kindly share board minutes with me. They're very you know they do their best to communicate, but I'm only seeing things after the fact. There's no ability to to say well what about this? What about that? Um, but nonetheless, I think you have a with a new CEO being there and a new board um, or some new, newer members who are, who are very clear and, 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 and strong and forthright, I think that we have an opportunity. We have to continue to give them the support. Failure is not an option. And I think that's the, the most important message. Failure is not an option. Um, but you, you're, you're referring to the expectations of the newly appointed CEO. But certainly this CEO doesn't have the pedigree of the first CEO. And I would argue that many of the problems that are identified in the OE report are the result of the way things were established or not established by that CEO and that board at the time. So on, um, and, and I welcome your um, expectations of, of the, the new board and so But one of the, we were given evidence this morning that part of the problem that the board has is that they are making requests of cabinet, and those requests are not forthcoming. I.e., the one example that was given was the amending amending legislation to the utility regulation and competition law which was passed in June 2018 and has not yet commenced. And the, the, the chairman was very concerned um, about a judicial review getting them in trouble. Is there an explanation why this has not commenced? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I believe you have, um, in the past, if I do recall, I, I don't get to hear all the debates and discussions here, but I think this is a point that you have raised from time to time in the past about adding in commencement clauses or, or what have you and, and having a specific date or time by which something needs to be done. Um, it will be commenced shortly. We ran into one small snag, a very small snag, which we had to, we had to uh, clarify because there was a, a subsequent revision, as you can see the law is a 2019 revision, um, I think which was completed in February 2019, February 2019 which, which uh, in retrospect when reminded, of, when reminded about the commencement order by off reg, we had to, to, to scratch our heads and wonder what needed to be, whether one would usurp the other. But I am sure that it doesn't cause any harm. We can still commence it, and it needs to be done. And for that, I must take responsibility in getting the cabinet paper forward. So are you saying that the changes that were passed in 2018, because they had not commenced, 
are not incorporated into the 2019 revision. Okay. That's, Correct. That's, that's, well, I have one curious um, question about the, 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 the part of what is identified in the Auditor General's report and a lot of the questions this morning was around the governance structure and the fact that the executive directors sit on the board as equal members while not having a vote. Um, but if you're persuasive, you don't need to vote. Or if you can intimidate through technicality, you don't need to vote. Um, why was the change made to give the authority to appoint the executive directors to the chief executive officer and not the board? But the principle that the law also says that the executive directors and the chief fuel inspector under the day-to-day -day management of the chief executive officer shall be principal advisors to the board and not to the chief executive officer. Do, do, do you see the, the, the governance conflicts that exist in that kind of a relationship? I can't speak exactly to the, the rationale, but I, I do recall uh, from the outset when Authoreg was being um, formed, formulated, I do recall that there was this dichotomy of roles identified, and I do believe the consultant and the ministry at the time spoke to the importance of ensuring that the voices of those directors, because again, um, uh, if you look at the report, I think the report speaks to the fact that, uh, the Auditor General's report speaks to the fact that some of the, some of the, um, members of the board, I can't recall if it's non-executive or executive, but some members of the board don't necessarily have um, expertise or experience in some of the specific sectors, right? So the thought was, the thought process was is that you would have individuals at the executive level with that, with the technical capacity and expertise. And it would be important that when the board as, you know, the, ex the non-executive, I'll go again, no, yes, the non-executive members. <laughs> it's a lot of syntax that you can get easily uh, confused. But I think the general thought was that the, the, the non-executive members in coming to decision, especially on a sectoral issue, should listen and consider the advice of uh, being provided by that executive director. Now, is there a, perhaps a more efficient way or more I could I say orthodox way of achieving that. I do think that you know individuals could be invited to board meetings, and there's a there's a alternative arrangement. But I do believe we've also seen that this similar arrangement exists elsewhere. So I think it's about figuring out what works best for our context, and and um, having not, never attended a board meeting, not being a member of a board, or having a an individual in my um, a designate from my office participate in board meetings. I can't tell you about the mechanics of how those relationships and the, and the dynamics of those relationships and how that works. I can't speak to that. It would be unfair for me to project any, any um, uh, views or opinions on that. But I think we have, uh, it's, to say the least, it is uncommon for our context. The, 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 the more accepted way is that when you need those kind of technical presentations for a modern agenda, those people are brought in made because th th there was a famous saying here by from one developer who was on a board and he said that you know he, when, when it comes to his business he just tell the fellas I go in outside well you approve this for me so <laughs> having these people there I think is, is something that I think we need to look at very carefully down the road um, but one of the other concerns was the um, The, 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 the whole of reg, regiment of legislation when it was presented here in Parliament was supposed to give teeth, give substance, give functionality to government's ability to control prices and to control quality of uh, product being delivered in these entities, especially in the fuel sector. I mean, 
I was here, I, I listened to the, 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 the minister moving the bill, and that was the genesis and that was the justification for creating this bureaucracy. We're still waiting on regulation of prices, right? Um, and one of the things you, 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 you mentioned earlier was that the government took a decision to directly fund um, off-reg as opposed to allowing off-reg to collect even the fees that were already being collected without the introduction of new fees, right? And I also noticed that there is a, 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 a conscious absence of any changes to the law when you did the 18 amendment that dealt with funding. Is the reason to that the same thing is that the government saw it as going against their policy of introducing taxation and therefore the, the funding mechanism for off-reg was not addressed in the amending legislation in 2018? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I guess the well-publicized financial management issues at Offereg would not help the cause for additional fees. It's pretty difficult to ask for, for more money for regulation um, when people aren't seeing the results and when there are concerns raised about these other governance issues. So uh, you, can, uh, you understand the politics involved in these things better than I do, but I, I think we have an a, a, a obligation at the end of the day to ensure that the public is being um, best served. And if we can find a way to absorb the cost from central government, which would you know, underwrite that, in a sense, what has happened. Um, I, I think it's, it, it has worked out fine for now because, you know, no one can say that, uh, no one can say that they've had to raise their fees as a result of a regulatory fee. That's not being blamed for anything. So, you know, perhaps those are things that can be looked at in the future when efficiencies are being achieved and when, you know, people are starting to see, the public is starting to see value for money. Um, we have capable people there, sir. We have people who care. Um, and I think they just got off to a very bad start. And, and, and so, again, the government is doing its part to, to support the ongoing implementation and, and, and function of, of, effective functioning of, of the regulator. <coughs> the um, Auditor General report identifies several areas of legislative conflict. None of those were addressed in the, the 2018. Can you give us some comfort that they are likely to be addressed in the very near future? And, and when do you have a time frame for their presentation to the Legislative Assembly? Mr. Chair, I can offer comfort, but not a time frame, sir. <laughs> That's the very best My, I my can comfort do. requires a time frame, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, my apologies for your discomfort, sir. Yes, let's appreciate it. <laughs>
then I think it's quite clear that further, uh, further legislative amendments are required and we have undertaken to consider that and I will do my part to, to do so. Is there a possibility that the inability of the government of the D, because the law was first passed in 2016 and brought into force January 2017, is this unwillingness of the government to introduce taxation to fund this off reg thing part of the problem why it was never resourced properly and therefore we had a situation where we had we didn't even have board members appointed for some five or six months we had one person appointed as ceo another person appointed as chairman of the board running the whole operation in my view totally ultra virus of the law but was that was it a question of resources, why they couldn't be, the board could not be constituted, or was, it, or was that a deliberate act? Because it's got to be one of the two. It, it, it has to either be that the government decided deliberately they weren't going to appoint a full board, or they didn't have the resources under which to do it. If I may, Mr. Chair, I think, I think it's important that we, we have some context around the original board and the original um, startup of off reg. Um, I think the URCO, URCL, you know, the, which is the legislation which gives, brings this to, to light, or brings this to life, um, makes it quite clear that cabinet is responsible for appointing the, um, the chair, right? But the rest of the appointees must be brought on board through the nominating process, right? So again, as you've been a member of cabinet, you understand that usually with a board, you have your conversations, you have your discussions, and you have a list of names, and they all agree, you put them forward, you can get that done overnight, uh, you know, if need be. This was a completely different process, which required advertisements, requires you know, I first had to get, you were, you were not the leader of opposition at the time, I, but I had to get the leader of opposition, the then leader of opposition's nominee. I had to get the premier's nominee to sit on the panel, right, the committee that reviews all these applications. So this was a full-on recruitment process, which you know takes a period of time. But you had a year. Remember the law set all that up in place in 2016. Mm -hmm. The whole justification for this new process of commencement at yes. a later date after the law is signed right. is to allow government to provide the resources, put in place the administrative stuff. So why would you appoint a chairman before you had a board recruited? What, what, what was he chairing? Well, well, if I may uh, draw your attention to section 105 or of the uh, part 17 of the law, it says on the date of the commencement of the section, the cabinet shall appoint the non-executive member who shall be the first chair of the board. And the first chair shall serve an initial term of three years. So we tied, it was, it was right there in the legislation itself. Um, it said the cabinet shall re appoint the remaining four non-executive members of the first board in accordance with the procedure set out in, the, in this law and two such um, non-executive members shall serve an initial term of two years and the other two non-executive members shall serve an initial term of four years. So I'm not sure how you could operate under the law if the law had not been commenced. Y you understand what I'm saying? I couldn't, couldn't put out the advertisements, I couldn't um, officially have the nominee of the leader of opposition, all that, you know. But the simple, the simple solution to that administratively Mm -hmm. was for cabinet to commence different sections at different times. That does, that, 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 that this is by commencement notice. We have precedent, the, the national conservation law is a good one. Mm -hmm. Some of that is not yet into, may not even yet be in vogue, although it was passed mm -hmm. way back when, right? Yeah. But my concern and my dilemma is, the law clearly sets out the process. 
but the law does not say that cabinet shall appoint the remaining four executive members after appointing the chairman of the board, right? Mm -hmm. So we understood. Well, well, actually, if I may, Mr. Chair, if I may, on that point, the chair of the board is a member of the nominating committee. So I couldn't have a nominating committee properly constituted without the chair being appointed. So okay. he couldn't, he couldn't so sit around the had to do, All the government had to do to, to, to put in place the proper governance structure mm -hmm. was to bring in section 105 mm -hmm. six months before they brought in the whole law, right? Anyway, that, that's all behind us now. The, the problem we have now is how do we get from here to where we actually get the public believes that Offreg is worth the money that government spends on it, which I would suggest very strongly to you that that's not the opinion of the public at the moment. They, um, to, uh, Mr. Chair, just for the record, if I can just obviously clarify that my, it's my view that uh, funding was not tied to the, the appointment of the board. That was not a, an issue. Okay. The, the issue of funding wasn't tied to that in any way, shape, or form. Thank you, sir. Mr. Austin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and certainly thank you to the witness for being here this afternoon and for answering the questions, which I believe are as honest as he possibly can. My question, I only have one question, and it emanates from your responses to the chairman. Um, which, Mr. Chairman, I will ask through you. The witness agreed with the statements that emanated from the chair, which expressed concern about the viability and benefit of Offreg as an entity by both members of the general public as well as members of this honorable legislative assembly, which I might add includes members of the executive as you also gave evidence which suggested that the cabinet itself has had to give specific policy guidance reminders to Offreg from time to time over the past three and a half, almost four years in terms of what the government and therefore the public expects from them. Things like affordable prices in petroleum products, affordable prices in energy utilities, further development in renewable energies and a move away from fossil fuel dependence, and the expansion of broadband and telecommunication options to the wider Cayman Islands, specifically the Eastern Districts and to the sister islands. And I know this question has been asked a number of ways I suppose I'm just going to add another way to it. Why has it been so difficult to keep Offreg's attention focused on these policy directions versus the apparent total independence they appear to enjoy, allowing them to dance to their own beat and timeline, spare no expense? How, and also, how are we, the government, how have we, the government, have attempted to provide an alternative to what is the generally perceived impression of Offreg's viability and benefit? How have we tried to correct the course in which the good ship Offreg is sailing under. And I just add, given that Offreg consists almost entirely of private sector, former private sector employees, coming from practically one specific former private sector company, what efforts are being done to change the culture within Offreg, a culture which reminds them that we are all, at the end of the day, public servants. And that is what separates the public service from the private sector, specifically as opposed to generally 
are my questions directed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the member for that question. Mr. Lyon Rose, go ahead. Uh, thank you, sir. I, I think the, Mr. Mr. Chair, in answering the question, I believe that the, the Honorable Member has touched on uh, a point which I think has been summarized best in a little saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I think that while we have key strategic goals articulated. There's no one who would, you know, no one can say they don't know what government wants them to focus on. I think anyone who has watched the proceedings of the LA and, and, and seen the, 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 heard the comments from members of opposition, whether it's in this honorable house or on the radio or um, seen the correspondence between the, the, the uh, central government and the authority, there is clarity as to what the areas and concerns are. And again, we all live in this community. We know what, what is worrying people, what's concerning people, and the impact they can have on that. So I don't think strategy has necessarily been the issue. I think culture has been the issue. And when you have a vacuum in leadership, um, as we did for a period in time there, you know, uh, that, that didn't help. But you also, <laughs> You also have a challenge, just an inherent challenge, and I think that was brought to bear in the, the points around a merger plan. Uh, we had one ministry which prepared the, the, it worked on the project of creating OFREG and the legislation, et cetera, and perhaps as a public service, the overall public service, we fell short in, in seeing the project through. The project wasn't just getting um, the individuals nominated. You know, I was very clear what my role was. My role was to, to get the board constituted by chairing the nominating committee, as is set out in the law. It was very clear in my role um, from the outset. But there was an inherent, and then there's an inherent challenge. Anybody who's married or has been married to becoming one is not an easy thing, right? Sometimes it's virtually impossible. You talk about taking three and four and making one out of them as even more challenging. So we had a marriage of ERA, ICTA, CPI, and of course trying to bring in, pulling the water regulation side of things. And each of those groups of individuals come with their own histories and their own cultures and their own um, practices, et cetera. And you'd have a mixture of individuals who worked, who would be public servants, considered public servants because they work for the statute or authority. You have others who would have come on board from, um, with extensive private sector experience, et cetera. But all of that doesn't just become a single culture overnight. And um, one of the things that we have done as a cabinet office, again, not overstepping our bounds, but to support and facilitate, especially with the arrival of the new CEO, we recognize, listen, we have to do everything to, to, to give him the opportunity to get his feet on the table and to, to kind of bring everybody around the, around the table. Because obviously there would have been some, I think that was touched on earlier, some, some challenges. You know, you, you're, you're now overseeing three other individuals who applied for the same job that you did. So there's some cultural issues and in, in, in getting people together. So one of the things in recognizing their challenges and gaps as a relatively young organization, the cabinet office's deputy chief officer facilitated a two-day retreat in November, um, December 2019, um, covering best practices on OFREG's purpose and mandate, um, their current reality and challenges, leadership qualities, visioning, core values, performance indicators, change management, um, team building, best practices, like breaking down silos. Because again, uh, one of the fundamental challenges I think with Off-Reg in terms of funding is that the way it was designed, if I recall correctly, the law almost stated that while you are one organization, funding 
if, you, if, if, if ICTA brings in, I think ICTA probably brings in the most revenues, if I recall. But you couldn't technically use the revenue from that sector to support the other entities or the other elements within that, that, that under that umbrella. It, it was, you know, that each sector was supposed to almost be self-supporting and autonomous. And I get, I understand the, you can understand the, the, the underlying premise behind that, but that leads to the hardening of silos as opposed to the softening. So if you have one section that's doing well and, and that's flourishing and the other one is not doing so, so well, or one just brings in more money than the other, then there's a tendency to feel and, you know, importance is, uh, money and, and importance seems to go hand in hand in a lot of, in a lot of organizations. I'm not saying that is the case, but the way we even wrote that legislation in, I, I never quite understood how in practical terms that was supposed to operate. But then nonetheless, we looked at breaking down silos, performance management, train development, stakeholder engagement, and, and reviewing their strategic plan and annual plan. And one of the important things with that exercise was that it wasn't just for senior management, it wasn't just for the board, but it included the staff themselves, right? The individuals who, who when, we're, when we're criticizing offering, um, these are the individuals who don't have the glam, quote unquote, glamorous jobs. And people you know, have their own impressions about offreg and, 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 and pay packets and those kind of things. I'm not getting to that, but I know that in any organization, the backbone of that organization are the, the, the staff, the, the individuals who, who are unseen, who come in day in, day out, do their jobs with commitment, with integrity, with, with, with passion because they believe in what they do and there's no glamour or glitz or glory in what they do and they're often forgotten. So we brought everybody around the table to be able to, to talk to one another, to see each other in a different light. There was no boss man and no, 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 no a subsidiary. Everyone was one. And it gave people an opportunity to speak their minds, to open up, to, to share their views and, and to highlight their strengths and what have you. So I received rave reviews from the chair, the CEO, other members of the staff thanking me, and really, really, I deserve no thanks. We have a brilliant Deputy Chief Officer, Mr. Robert Lewis, who is a passionate trainer, and, and, and I think he's been also been offering his policy training workshops as well, policy workshops, to, um, which would have been available to, to individuals there. So I just share that to point out that we recognize culture will eat strategy for breakfast. And so it's a small step. At the end of the day, they have to implement these things, and but they were committed to it, and people really got into it. And I think it was an important step in allowing the new CEO to get a sense of who his team was, and for his team to get a sense of who he was. They went, you know, they didn't go anywhere fancy. They just went to Georgetown Yacht Club, where they had a, con a conference room. So don't worry, no, no pile of expense was incurred. But the benefit of what that did for boosting morale, because clearly, you know, if you're hearing your organization's name not in the best light day in, day out. Morale can, cannot be good. And again, my view is that failure is not an option. And if that's something smaller we can do to help to impact and to create a positive impact on the culture of that organization, then that's the least that we can do. And I'm committed to seeing, seeing it through. Mr. Chairman, um, Truyan, first of all, I want to thank Cabinet Secretary Rose um, for coming here today. He's one person I do have a lot of time for because I've always found him to be a very decent, but more importantly, a very competent person. Through you, Mr. Chairman, I just want to read a section of the Utility Regulation and Competition Law 2016, in particular section 6.2. G of it, and it reads, in performing its functions and exercising its power under this or any other law, the office may establish and maintain an official website. We, in this day and age 2020, where a website is literally monitored for anybody to do business with, if you were to go on offreg.ky, which is the official website, 
and go into the about us section and you look for the members of the management team as you click on all of their name it will say coming soon if you look on the board of directors and you click on their names it's going to say coming soon mr chairman that is appears to be the mantra with offreg is it's coming soon and unfortunately in this day and age when people are especially the challenges that we have now where a lot of families are struggling coming soon needs to come and the question i have for the witness after saying all of that mr chairman is this reckon we, we, we the public accepts and as i said before that these utility companies need to be regulated but at the end of the day when you do go back to the law and it clearly says um in ter the principal functions of the office in the markets and sectors for which it has responsibility are to protect the short and long-term interests of consumers in relation to utility services and it continues further on that is the reason we're here today mr S chairman and my question to witness through you is simply this when can we start expecting to see cheap fuel prices and when can we start expecting to see better internet service because at the end of the day while culture does eat strategy what also tastes better is when the proof is in the pudding and that is what it is that we want to know when can we start eating the pudding that we have been promised and we can't see yet and that is the only question i have on this um thing and ultimately i know it is not the cabinet secretary's responsibility but that is the culture of offreg that needs to change and i think to some extent my colleague from prospect touched on it when it comes on to culture there needs to be a cultural shift in this country and it's not just in offreg because we have the same issues with pension and a lot of different industries where this we need to get this whole shift going and that is ultimately the question and i know to some extent it is not a question that the cabinet sector can answer because some of it is policy related but from a governance standpoint something as basic as getting the website up you know the members are i am sure each of them have a short bio and this is a cut and paste job of taking their bio and putting on a website which would have been so much better than to just have sitting on the website of an entity that is regulating ICT and other multi-million dollar companies to be having coming soon on this day in 2020 almost four years since this law has passed is unacceptable and that is a culture that needs to change just get the low line stuff done get the small stuff done and that is the kind of stuff you need to build up credibility because if you can't get the small stuff done of just taking a bio cutting and pasting and putting a website to comply with the law how then can i expect that you will comply with the bigger things that the law expects you to do when you can't get the small stuff and we, we, we have been on this website thing and it's not just an offering it's in government you go to gis website last time i looked at it was a month ago there was a picture of the premier and the former governor ellen kilpatrick on the very front page of gis and if you go on gis um, page you don't even see any of the current stuff that they have even been pushing out that is the culture that needs to change and like i said it is just permeated into other sectors of government and that is ultimately what i would really like to see the cabinet secretary and those in position of governance get these small things done and that is all I'm asking for. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you you uh, mentioned earlier that there are separate ministries that have water, ICTA, fuel. How is, how, explain to me how that is possible if you have a regulatory authority which you have responsibility for, which is responsible for all those things. What, what are the ministries doing with these subjects?
Um, if I can attempt to explain, Mr. Mr. Chair. During, again, the formulation of Offreg, the view was to have the administrative functions, you know, dealing with the budget and, and, and those matters, placed with the premier. That's where we come in. We are obviously the portfolio, not a ministry, but we're the portfolio that has that administrative oversight. But it was understood that you could very well have subject areas, the actual subjects themselves, and the, and, and the policy that drives the subjects under a different ministry. In fact, that this was this was how it was created. It was this was no mistake. This is exactly how it was designed. Um, and and for instance, uh, that allows uh, the direction of of ICT general ICT policy and 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 um, those things to be handled by a, a different ministry. And, and so, as it turned out, after the last election. We ended up with um, infrastructure subjects being under one ministry, but water being under another ministry. So I think even the, the legislation itself uh, speaks to minister with responsibility for the sector. So there's an identification in there that there could be times where the minister is responsible for the sector itself. You can't have a regulatory, an overarching regulatory authority for which a portfolio or a minister has responsibility. But then you're telling me that we have a sector, water, which some other minister can do, and, 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 and fuel. And so what is Offreg doing? And, and what, is the what is the ministry who has sector? If the minister is driving policy for water, right? What is off reg who's regulating water doing? So I can uh, give you an example from the uh, an easy example would be the IC an easier example would be the ICT side, right. perhaps. W when we say that um, it's very clear that the responsibility um, not for regulation rests with the ministry for that sector. So for instance, if a new product or something is coming to the market, um, and uh, it wouldn't be for, I don't think it would be appropriate for new players in the industry to, to discuss or negotiate that with um, any, any you know, concessions or whatever they want to bring in directly with, with the regulator, or the regulator would have to decide on the license conditions, et cetera. But whether as a government, overall government policy, um, with whether we want this particular product or good or service available in Cayman, I think that is within bounds of, uh, of, of the, the executive to, to determine. But then the healthy separation exists because the regulator has then the ability to, to, to provide the, the licensing conditions and, and what have you. You wouldn't want those two in the same house under the same roof. So under the current governance structure, water has a separate board other than off-reg board, which manages what? No. The, the Water Authority, if I can cl cl clarify, Mr. Chair, the Water Authority rests under the Ministry of um, Employment, Youth, Sports, Agriculture, and Lands. That's, that's the, 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 the ministry responsible for yeah. the Water Authority, right? But Offreg regulates the Water Authority. So the subject of water sits with that ministry, right? But the regulation, the regulation sits with, with another. But, 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 okay, so you could have a situation then where a government could develop a whole different policy from what the regulators will approve, take it to cabinet, get it approved, who resolves a conflict? 
I mean, I mean, this this whole thing is beginning to sound to me like this was nothing more than an intended exercise in futility, designed not to achieve what the public was asking for, and that was better internet and lower fuel prices. Because everything we try to, to find out, we hear is some other body that is doing some other thing. And, and I would assume that the minister who, has response, who had responsibility for off-reg automatically water is already in off-reg and the regulatory section of that is, 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 is because that's all the government should be doing is regulating the industries, not, not providing the, 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 the water authority is a, is, 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 is a sector of government, right? Anyway, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm missing something here that, that some genius at a higher pay grade than me can put together, but I can't connect the dots. Coming soon. Coming soon. The dots will soon be connected. All right. Um, I have a couple of other questions, though. <coughs> None of these authorities, other than off-reg, is new. ICATA was functioning for years. Water Authority was functioning for years. The Electrical Regulatory Authority was functioning well for years, right? How is it possible that we can create an entity which can be so disruptive and so destructive in trying to merge things that are working so that nothing is working now and, and everybody has this, falls back on this thing, well, you know, we, 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 we come in so on, but um, we, we don't really get there yet, or, or this person is not, not, not cooperating, or that person is not cooperating. When, when we have an overarching body that was created to do this? I don't know if you can answer that, because I can't answer it, but anyway, that's okay. We were told this morning that one of the problems that the Auditor General has identified is the lack of a succession plan. We were told this morning that the first CEO, um, Mr. J.P. Morgan, did a complete succession plan, and that succession plan was approved by the board. Have you seen that succession plan? And can you explain to us then why the succession plan was not followed? If such a succession plan, we sh we're expecting to get a copy of it delivered to us later. Mr. Chair, I honestly cannot recall receiving the succession plan. I, I do recall discussions about what would happen at the end of, of Mr. Morgan's tenure, but I would need to refresh myself on, on, on what that succession plan entailed, and I, I wouldn't, I don't have it to hand, sir. It is, is, is a succession plan or a new succession plan under consideration, under development of the board for the organization as it is now? Again, Mr. Chair, because of my position, not being on the board, I, I wouldn't be in a position to, to answer that question. Um, but perhaps someone who was the, on the board would be able to. So one of the things included, that was not included in the directives from cabinet to, to the board was the development of a proper succession plan funding of the succession plan, implementation timelines, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That was not a directive that was sent to the board. Okay. I, I, I do not believe so, sir. I don't recall any such directive. Okay, thank you, Mr. Brooks. Through you, Mr. Chair. When the chairman decided to throw his hat into the arena as a CEO, was the board functionability, well, how did, was there any, uh, how did this affect the running of the board? And the recruitment process, thank you. Well, again, I couldn't speak to how it affected the running of the board. I can just recall that during that time of that suggestion coming forward, um, it was during a time in which 
there was no permanent CEO and there was a rotation, there was a rotation of acting CEOs and a number of challenges existed. So that's the time in which that suggestion was, was brought forward. Was there an objective by having acting CEOs? In other words, were the CEOs who I believe happened to be, um, what the, the chairman call them, sectorial directors, were they being tested as to their capability of CEO? Or, or how did the suggestion come about about rotation of, of, of these, these uh, executive directors? Again, given that the board appoints, it would be a board decision to appoint the acting chair. You know, I would not necessarily have been privy to those discussions right. or decisions, and, and I wouldn't have been in the room at the time. We would have no representation on it. Obviously, there were, were comments made, and 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 I would. It would be unfair of me uh, to infer that the chair wouldn't reach out to to share what was happening. The but first one was done by the. I, I couldn't speak to that otherwise. Not to interrupt you, but. Correct me if I'm wrong, the first CEO was appointed by cabinet. Succeeding CEOs is, is intended to be the responsibility of the board. Yes, sir. It's a process so, outlined in the, in the, similar to the PAL, you right. know, it's, it's cemented in the public authorities law. And that's the other thing as well, too. By the time it came around for the second, um, for the full recruitment of the CEO, the PAL, was, the PAL would have been in effect at that time. So you're not aware that the purpose of the rotation of existing, um, I think they're called executive directors in the sectors, was a methodology of testing their ability to be CEO and whether that was part of what JP Morgan set in place as part of his succession plan? I can't, uh, Mr. Chair, through you, I can't speak to what Mr. Morgan set in place and whether that being part and parcel of that, but quite clearly, um, as in the public service, when you give people an opportunity to, to, to act, you'd imagine that the, the next logical step for each of the individuals who are acting, who had a peer of acting, would be the, the CEO's position, potentially, and it would be for them to apply. And clearly, having that opportunity to act would give them, as well as the board and others, an opportunity to, to see how they conduct themselves in the position. And in the absence, as identified in the Auditor General report, of any kind of performance standards, they would not be in existing records as to the standards at which either of those performed during those period of time. If such, Mr. Chair, if such records exist, they would be kept at off-reg and, and something to which the, the um, board would be privy to. But again, that's not something that would be retained in central government. Any other questions? Um, Barbara, Austin, you all have any questions? David, any? No, okay. But um, Mr. Mr. Rose, thank you very much for coming, sir. And um, we hope that we will be in a position to make some recommendations that will get to the two things that the public wants and which this regime was set up for, lower prices at the pump, and better internet and also, right? But just to give you a, 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 a so, right, the, um, they're not coming at all. The, um, I did an analysis of, of, of my CUC bill, June 2019, 1,300 and odd kilowatt hours. My fuel bill was $164. June last month, 1,300 and something kilowatt hours. My bill was $99, right? Represents a 40% reduction in the fuel factor in the bill on the same kilowatt hours, right? And when I look at the North American market, in particular around the published golf course, I am seeing that same 40% reduction 
at the pump. But here, our Fred is pounding itself on the chest and topping itself on the head and putting on his top hat and its um, dancing shoes and taking credit for 14%. Do you have any insight into why the public in Cayman are not getting that same 40% reduction in fuel costs that CUC obviously is getting based on the numbers I see on my bill. I don't know what CUC pays for, for fuel, but I'm just using what I pay on my bill as, as, as an example. Mr. Chair, I, like you, am eagerly awaiting the results of the, the studies that they have been, um, uh, offering has undertaken around the, the whole pricing around fuel. I'm, I, it's my understanding that it is, it is very close to, to being wrapped up now. Um, it may indeed have been finished, because a lot happened in the last couple of, I'm not sure how COVID would have imp impacted that, but I know that they were getting close to the, to the, to the finish line. And of course, you know, we would ask questions just like the rest of the public when we saw those, when we saw uh, market prices at, at zero and below. And of course, we recognize it's not just a simple uh, factor of, well, if it's, uh, the market is, is at this price, then that's a direct correlation to, to what we pay at the pump. However, we were told that, um, we have been told, as, as others have been, that this study is almost completed now. So I think that's a very important piece of work. Um, I hopefully, hopefully it will give us all a, a greater sense of clarity, and we will take it from there when that arrives, sir. Well, I, I mean, to, to repeat the slogan that's been started, soon come, is there any particular reason why you use the terminology study rather than, invest, than investigation. Because you see, I think it's, maybe I'm wrong again, but I think it's a simple formula. The cost of fuel in the Cayman Islands should represent basically the three factors. The original cost price, the cost of transportation, storage, et cetera, into the Cayman Islands, and the cost to distribute it locally. These two, the cost to distribute it locally and the cost to get it to the Cayman Islands don't vary a lot. They may vary on an annual basis, but they don't vary month to month or, sh or, or every three months, right? Because shipping prices don't, don't, don't avascalate like that. The thing that changes is original price, right? So if the original price goes down, the price should go down. I can assure you that I am not aware of a single instance where that original price went up, that the price at the pump did not go up in game on. Again, maybe I missed a few, but you know, I, I drive a lot. I live on the outside, right? My um, four-year-old truck has eight or 7,000 miles on it. These people who live in Georgetown and drive 500 miles a year don't know what the cost of fuel is, right? So I don't think it's a complicated thing. It seems to me that off reg insists that this is such a complicated formula that it takes them months to calculate it. I mean, they should have this formula on their computer and they should be able to put in those three things and say what they are. Mr. Chair, if I, I may, the, from the, the, the bits of information that I've seen, I, I think it's a bit quite a significant yeah, there are quite a few more factors than, than three. Such as? Um, I can't recall all the, 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 the various ones. But Therefore, I they're not big, because you can't remember them. I remember a number of different colors and, and, <laughs> and, 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 and things, but it all depends on, on, on a number of regional factors as well. You know, where are our fuels coming? It's the refinery process. You have to take that into consideration. I, I don't want to... That's the cost you're taking, price. You're taking, cost you're taking price. me down a road that, that I'm not... Um, that is not my area of expertise, and I'm not going to venture into that. I believe that you probably will have other individuals who could speak to that more clearly. But what I can say, in fairness to those individuals, that that, that there are a number of other factors, and I do also understand that one of the key pieces of one of the key challenges is 
getting the information from got, the, the companies themselves as right. well, because and these are, you know, part that, of that's the, not a, a right, simple part process. Part of the reason we can't get the cost now is because customs charges duties on volume. I mean, Mr. Chris, and take care of that on the 27th, we're bringing up a private member's motion to change the custom duty from volume to CIF like everything else, because then they have to declare the price. So government will know what the original cost and the cost of getting it to Cayman is on every shipment of fuel that comes in. Suffice it to say, so it passes through many hands before it gets here. It shouldn't. <laughs> the, um, true, Mr. Chairman, um, just to point to the Cabinet Secretary, if you go on rubiscaymanans.com website, there's a section there called Fuel IQ. And and the different part where it says I'm um, like import, if you actually click on that, it will actually carry you to our next website, I think called Glo Global Prices or something. And you can actually get to see the day-to-day -day cost. You can actually convert it like UK gallons. And you can actually get to see the cost across a lot of different countries. And you'll see that even, I think like Jamaica came on, and a couple of them that are listed in the Caribbean that are there, 80, Puerto Rico, and et cetera. And then you can have an idea to see just how much extra Cayman is paying compared to people right around us. I, I went through it um, last night, but it only gives you the price at a particular day, which is like current, so it didn't give historical information. But for those in the listening public, they can have an idea to see exactly how much more that Cayman is actually paying compared to other different places and could draw their own uh, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, um, Assumptions, but um, the, the question, the last question I just want to add um, after listening to the, um, the cabinet secretary, and I've always been about the, the, the future. As I mean, in politics, we always say there's no future in the past. What has happened has happened. The last question I'd have to you, sir, is if there's one governance thing that you can change in your office, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, <coughs> something that you could do different that you think would improve the process. You know, what would that thing be that you think would basically would help off regular their governance process? Because it appears that the teething problems somewhat have them a little bit distracted in terms of what they should be focusing on. And we have spent more time on administrative and governance and everything as opposed to maybe say regulation. So with that, what would be the one thing if you wish you could change if you had your way that you would say, you know what, I would like to see this happened or this done that I think can actually make the process better or make off -reg better. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, as I've said before, the utilities company need to be regulated. We have to find an effective and efficient way to regulate them. So non-regulation is not a choice. It's not an option. But if we have to regulate them, what's the best way to do it? And I've, I've, I've said earlier, even with the, um, the chairman when he was here, this started out as an exercise to grant certain synergies and based on the Auditor General report, when you combine all of them of where they were individually, individually, you know, they, you know cost the country more than when they were separate by themselves. And an error does not become a mistake until you fail to correct it. And there's nothing wrong if we're going to say, you know what, we tried a grand experiment, it didn't work. Maybe we need to look at maybe carrying things back the way they were so we can get concentrated expertise on, on different things. Because you look at the membership of the board, you're trying to find five non-executive members um, to govern an era with four responsibilities. And you're literally going to be probably finding one of each or one of whatever. And then, of course, you have the different um, executive members on the board also. The question I have to ask myself, looking at the ICTA board, and there are, I think, maybe seven or ten members before, just on ICT alone, you look at the ERA board, you had more specialized um, expertise there. Maybe the board is too small, maybe you need to expand it, maybe you need more some committees. I mean, and, and this is where I'm just trying to get to, like, what can we do to make this more efficient? Because it's, there, it's clearly there's still teething problems after three and a half years, and I have not yet seen anything to give me any level of comfort to say that this is going to change in the next year or two. And so if there's one thing that you could change or you think it could improve the process, what, what would that be? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it, in, in considering this uh, question, um, obviously 
what we, what we want going forward is to make a positive impact on the lives of our, our citizens and residents. And that will always be evidenced by some of the key things that, that, that the chair has pointed out and things that the cabinet has emphasized for a very long time. Um, I think it would also be great if they could achieve, I know they're doing some good work on, on looking at this very uh, important long-term issue of, of our connectivity with the rest of the world. And so I know they're making progress on that. But I think if I reflect on the, the, our own experience within the civil service, um, governance is, is critical. If your governance framework is not right, again, everything else that you try to, is going to create problems in terms of your culture and you're gonna be, you know, have challenges in implementing your strategy. So I think we, we can't brush over the governance issues. And I think that's where, again, my responsibility and role um, as envisioned under the public authorities law as a chief officer um, comes in to support that. And I think that's where we can provide help because if I look at the, the, the civil service, um, our journey to world class has not been an easy journey. It's not been simple. But I must, I must recognize the, the work of, of the thousands of civil servants who have committed to the deputy governor's vision of a world-class civil service. And when we look at some of the, the, the historical governance issues that we faced when it came to our, our own accounting procedures and practices, I mean, I don't think we have a dreamt of the day in which the chair would be inviting individuals down here to receive a plaque, an award. I know that, that there was a time where CFOs were, you know, the morale was challenged because we had all these outstanding accounts and, and, and annual reports weren't done and, and you know, there's questions around financial reporting. There was never real questions about the probity, uh, and, and, but there was issues around just the timeliness of getting these things done. We were lagging behind and it would be pretty hard to talk about a world-class civil service if you have all these piles of things still outstanding. And I think that, you know, winning just has a, uh, winning is like a magnetic force. When you start to get those little victories right, for instance, performance management, you know, that's an expectation within the civil service. Everyone understands that when we're a civil servant, you're going to have to sit down and do a performance assessment. You'll have a set of goals, not just KPIs, but you know, you sit down. When, when my performance assessment is done, the, the deputy governor sits with the premier to find out what do you want him to do in this coming year? What do you want cabinet secretary to focus on? You know, so I know going into it what I have to do. And so you're setting the mark. I feed that down to my team. My team all understands. And, you know, I, I can honestly say that while we're not in a place to, to, to do a victory lap, Mr. Chair, I can honestly say that because of dealing with the, the, the governance issues and a deputy governor, he tackled that right away, got on the board of the, the, resolving some of these these, these legacy issues. That helped to build a, a culture of excellence. And yes, we don't, there's a lot of things we don't get right still, but I think it all came together recently in our response to COVID. I think people can see a civil service that cares, people stepping outside the box, people understanding, and even we had to spend money and this and that, the governance around that, even an emergency, was there. It wasn't, a, it wasn't the Wild West. You had people critically, critic, you know, people placing themselves in harm's way to serve because they believe in the organization they work for. They understand their role, their responsibility, and there's a culture of excellence. So I, I urge that we continue to support the development of that culture of excellence within within off-reg, the little things like performance management, they're not little, they're not small, you know, consistency across the board with, you know, not the uh, board with a small b, <laughs> you know, across the, the organization when it comes to remuneration and, and all these kind of things. I, I think that all those things are, are absolutely critical. Adherence to, to the policies, travel policy and, 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 and procurement, um, um, 
taking all these things on board and ensuring that becomes a part and parcel, so that becomes second nature in there. That will, will help, that will help tremendously because it'll, it'll um, how can I say, dial down the, 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 dial down the distractions. Because I think, you know, so many of these other issues have, have, have eaten up so much time, eaten up so much energy, no pun intended. So my view is to help, my view is that whatever we can do to continue to help them, and I believe this Auditor General's report does go a significant way to outlining some simple steps. And what it points out, and I think the, the, the previous witness would have pointed to the fact that there are wins, right? But it's hard to see the wins when people are seeing, seeing other things and other issues. And, and the Auditor General's report spoke to the wins and the things that are going better and things that are going the right direction. I think we have to ensure that they remain on that dire in, going in that direction. And that's what we can do to support them um, from the cabinet office. You know, um, thank you very much for that um, answer. I can honestly say to you that there has been um, a big improvement. I mean, I have had my own dealings with many chief officers and even MDs and CEOs of statutory authorities and government-owned companies. I can say for the record, and I've said before, yourself, Wes Owell, Ken Jefferson, Gloria, all switched on. And I can tell you from my own engagement within the dealing with other people within the private sector that there is a certain amount of professionalism and caliber that you guys bring to the table. The challenge, and this is more something, I guess, for the deputy governor and the governor itself, is how do we roll out that culture? Because if you go back to the genesis of the public authorities law, it is also to recognize that there were entities that were run away. And I really do feel bad because entities like SEMA, who I look at their work a lot, is more switched on than, say, someone else, unfortunately, when the sun shining on the righteous, is shining on the righteous, too. And when you pass a law, it affects the good operating entities as opposed to some of the bad ones, them, too. And I really do feel bad for those that, that I get caught in, in this net. And what it is that we ultimately need to do is to take that culture that some of you guys have achieved. And I can say, all oh, that. Some chief officers I have absolutely full confidence in. And I can equally say some chief officers would have prayed to God the government don't change either because they won't be there. I mean, I can say that to you based on some different stuff. So from that standpoint, you know, it is about rolling that culture out. And Mr. Rose, I really wish to God that some of what you have and the others that have listed, Gloria, Wes, Ken, can be ruled out elsewhere across the public service, and in particular the statutory authorities. The government is getting it. Core government is actually getting it. You look at the Public Service Pension Board. We're just looking at pensions re um, recently. What they have done over there has put a lot of the, the private pension companies to shame. You know what I mean? So there's this belief that public sometimes have that government is inefficient. I can say to you, based on going through a lot of different stuff, there are parts of government that is actually world class already and is already exceeding expectations. But then unfortunately, when people say the civil service or the public service, everybody comes into that umbrella. And I really do feel bad. And what is actually missing is for those that are not performing, they're not being fired. They're either being transferred to another department or the problem is going someplace else. And until we start firing people, terminating people, and letting people go for incompetence and everything else, we'll not achieve world class. You know, and so for those entities and for those other chief officers that are listening, I hope to God they do take an example and, and take a page out of your book and others to say, you know what, at least you can accept that we have problems. And that is the, the first point of fixing problems, is to accept that there's a problem. Many have come and are very dogmatic in their defense of incompetence. And at the end of the day, as I said, the only measure that OFREG is going to ultimately be held for in the public is faster internet speed and cheaper fuel. Anything else, it really don't matter. But I just want to thank you very much, and it, I think you've been frank and, and, and straightforward, and I, I just want to say thanks again for coming here and you know, keep up the good work. Thanks. So, well, I'd also like to add my thanks to it, but I would also um, suggest that your current chairman's view of the Auditor General report does not jibe or coincide with your view. 
and I think it's important that we see these reviews as an opportunity for collaboration and, and, and correction where correction is necessary and we try to stay away from that combative um, attitude that, that, that we see in, in, in some sectors. But thank you for your time and have a good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members.
In session. Yeah, all right. I'll do though. Yeah, Bible on my right hand. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give to this honorable legislative assembly shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Good afternoon, Mr. Anderson. I'd just like to welcome you to the Public Accounts Committee and thank you for finding the time to come and give evidence before us. As you will have been made aware, we are this afternoon talking about the efficiency and effectiveness of the Utility Regulation and Compet Competition Office, commonly referred to as OFREG, and you have been invited as your position as a Executive Director uh, I think you're responsible for the electrical component of, of, of it. And anyway, when you answer the first question, you give your full title and your full name and the title so that that is what's recorded in the hands of it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Vanguard Anderson. My position at OFREG is an Executive Director of Energy and Utilities with responsibility for electricity, water, and wastewater. Exactly. Okay. Um, some of the things identified in the Auditor General's report is the relationship of the executive directors like yourself sitting on the board. Uh, and, and my question would you do you? Ha find a conflict in, in, in that role, and it, it, does that role present any difficulties to you in, in, in managing your operation? Mr. Chairman, my answer is I'll be candid and succinct as possible. I do not find it a conflict of interest. As a matter of fact, 
the URC law specifically stipulates that the executive directors are, con are considered the primary advisors of the board because of their, their specialties. And it's interesting to note that Offreg was formulated off of the UK regulatory model, which was the first one that started looking at liberalizing markets. And if you look at the regulatory authorities that are there, ranging from Scottish Water right through to the Office of Roads and Railroads, they all have executive directors on their boards. And Mr. J.P. Morgan, better known to us as, affectionately known to us as, as J.P., as he preferred to be called, followed that model and recognized that the importance of having the executive directors on the board was because the entity itself could, any decision it makes regarding regulatory matters could be subject to JR, judicial review. The other issue that arises there is that none of the non-executive directors have any experience in the respective sectors that we regulate. And so if, if they make a decision regarding any matter regarding the licensees, then those decisions could be subject to judicial review. And that is why the law says that the board shall give due regard, shall, not may, shall give due regard to the advice of the executive directors. But the, the, the normal way that that is done in, in public authorities in, in, in Cayman is that if whatever matter is before the board and it needs that kind of technical expertise to advise the board, that person who has that comes in and, and makes a presentation to the board and gives them the recommendation. Um, and, and I think if you looked at the boards that you mentioned, the, the executive directors are outnumbered on the board. In this situation here, although you're not, you, you, they, everybody says that it's okay because you don't vote, right? There are only four appointed members, non-executive members, plus the chairman, and there are four uh, executive directors plus the CEO. Am I correct? I think that's the makeup of the board, right? Mr. Chairman, no, that's incorrect. It, it was recently changed to comply with the public authorities law where there's a, a six to 40 representation of non-executive directors versus executive directors on the board. So three, I would no. also, also like to add that even the civil service public sector good governance handbook recognizes that expertise of, 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 of people like ourselves are required on the board so that the board makes proper decisions. That is found on page 22 of that handbook. Um, thank you um, very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank Mr. Anderson also um, for coming down here today. Um, I'm going to say the makeup of the board is really my um, primary concern. What I'm more concerned with is the effectiveness of the board. And through you to, Ms. to the witness, Mr. Chairman, can you just kind of explain to this committee and in particular the listening public like what goes into the regulation of these entities like say a CUC like what is the day to day regulation or the month to month or quarter to quarterly regulation of CUC entails like what is it does the, um, your office do in regards to protecting the public from say a monopoly like CUC does, how is it regulated our primary, thank Mr. Chairman, to you, to uh, MLA Chris Saunders. Our primary responsibility is enshrined in the URC law as well, is to ensure that 
consumers pay the least affordable cost of electricity, and secondly, to also ensure that the licensee makes a reasonable rate of return. And so when CUC licenses were issued in 2008 and the Electricity Regulatory Authority Board was set up, there has been several mechanisms enshrined in that license to ensure that CUC does not overcharge consumers. There's this call a rate cap adjustment mechanism and CUC cannot just simply raises rates. It has to apply to offer rate for us to either agree or disagree on the rates. And that license requires the UC to do quality reporting so that we have a, a real feel of, of what their spend is and, and what their operational statistics are anywhere from from how much diesel they're consuming to how many outages they are, uh, what was the revenue for the particular quarter. They also have to give us a, a report. And one of the things I instituted with regards to outages is that we have a real-time outage reporting mechanism that lets us know what's happening to the network at any point in time. I purposely left my phone off because it buzzes <laughs> almost instantaneously with, with outages. And one of the other things that we do according to that license and also to the law is that any capital expenditure that CUC has to make, they have to submit to offering a five-year capital expenditure plan for us to analyze, for us to, to pour through and, and agree to whether these business cases make sense or not, or whether it's in the best interest of the consumers. And at the end of that evaluation, if we feel that it is beneficial to consumers and, and also it, it meets the re revenue requirements of, of the licensee. Then our team puts together a board that we present to, sorry, we, we, we put together a board paper which we present to the board with our recommendations as whether or not to approve that capital expenditure plan. We do something similarly for any rate request that, that we get from CUC. Thank you very much. Um, has there ever been a case where they have made um, a request, the UC has made a request, and has it ever been turned on by the board? A request, a general request, or any? In, in terms of, the, going back to the assets, in terms of? Yes, uh, we have had capital expenditures, business cases that were submitted, and we have rejected them. And, ask them to supply more information, we would consider it at a different point in time if, if it met certain thresholds. One of the things um, going through CUC's bill, going down to the different things that they charge for, and based on my own research and looking at industry trends, once I take out the fuel factor, I find it to fall within the normal, I'm a fact, some of the better performing KPIs of industry. But that fuel factor in the bill is a serious bone of contention for me. And that is the one part of the bill that is literally almost unregulated. And it's roughly 50, or in some cases, 55% of the bill. The question um, through Mr. Chairman um, to Mr. Anderson is, what steps or what is Offreg doing with regards to that fuel factor um, part? Now, I am aware, because um, when the fuel prices went negative, I did reach out to Mr. Maliki at the time, and he did mention to me that Offreg did proactively reach out to CUC with regards to maybe some future options and so forth, and I'll ask him to elaborate or provide an update on that tomorrow. But what I'm trying to understand here is that because it's a pass-through cost, it doesn't seem to be one of the things that have been given a lot of it, well, I don't use the word priority, but a lot of what I call focus with regards to that part, because it represents 50 to 55% of the bill 
in, in, some, in some months. And the question to you is, what is being done or what can be done to regulate that part, or how is that part of the bill regulated, that fuel factor, like what is being done, what is being looked at, what is being considered, what are the components that goes into that analysis? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Mr. Chairman, through you to MLA Saunders, I can assure you that we monitor the fuel factor on a regular basis, actually on a monthly basis. And one of the things I'm pleased to say that it's gone down tremendously and consumers will, will see a, a significant impact on their bills and this month, next month, and subsequent months. With regards to what Off-Reg is doing about the fuel factors, and you're quite correct, it is a direct pass through to consumers. Well, one of the things that we have been actively pursuing is the, the prospect of getting alternative fuels here in, in the Cayman Islands versus you see the burn versus diesel, as well as trying to, to speed up the implementation of more utility scale solar PV plants, as, as, as well as other renewable energy plants. One of the things that we have done is we've done a consultation paper with regards to a renewable energy auction scheme to so that we can go out and have people bid for the capacity that is currently identified in the integrated resource plan, which is another 20 megawatts. We have been in several discussions with several suppliers of anywhere from liquefied natural gas to compressed natural gas to compressed petroleum. And one of the logistical problems that the, we faced before is that, that there's a sweet spot at which it makes economic sense for any of those fuels to replace diesel. Right now, we had a meeting about three weeks ago with somebody who has come up with a solution that enables the conversion of, of these diesel engines to natural gas without having to <laughs> face this <laughs> not in my backyard scenario uh, with another uh, storage facility at, at South Sound or, or elsewhere. And so there's, there are containerized solutions that are available right now for natural gas and also compressed natural gas as well as, as petroleum. And we are actively pursuing that with CUC and having discussions with, with these suppliers with the intention of trying to bring forward the conversion of these diesel engines to, to natural gas, as well as adding more renewables to the grid. Thank you very much. Earlier said that, um, before CUC can do <coughs> sorry, sorry, certain things, they'll have to reach out to get permission from off-reg, et cetera. And in some cases, those requests have been denied. Is something similar being done for the fuel companies? I mean, how are they regulated as opposed to, say, a CUC? Because CUC's contract is actually um, quite clear. As a matter of fact, I noticed that CUC actually has, I think, two licenses, one for the generation, which was issued in 2008, and I think the, the latest one was the transmission and distribution, which was done, I think, in 2014, uh, from that standpoint. The question is, CUC is well-regulated based on going through the license, looking at all the different conditions and everything else. Where does that exist for, say, Sol, Rubis, or the other fuel companies? How are they actually regulated? Mr. Chairman, to you, to Emily Sanders, I can't speak on behalf of the, the fuel sector. One of the things that is being done right now, I, I would say, is that there is a market assessments that are being done with regards to how a regulatory mechanism could be put in place to, to regulate these, these fuel suppliers. I think you can elaborate on that more for you. 
Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Just on the matter of CUC that's presently on the table now. Uh, first of all, I thank the witness for his attendance here this afternoon, and um, I shall try not to keep him too long. In the recent months, we've heard cries from the public that CUC's energy rates charged to the public have not been or have not matched the price of petroleum products, which at one time within the last three months has dropped to zero dollars per barrel in terms of global market price. Now, whilst we accept that CUC buys, or CUC prices rather, are paid on a two-month delay, surely CUC, like Cayman Airways and every, every other major consumer of petroleum products, are buying fuel today for the supply it intends to use two months from now. Yet the public rarely ever fully benefits in price reduction at the same discount that suppliers and distributors enjoy from time to time based on significant price fluctuations on the global market. How, therefore, has Offreg, but specifically your sector, achieved its function as or its function to protect the short and long-term interests of consumers in relation to utility services? And specifically, what independent investigation of CUC by the regulator, Offreg, if any, has been done to ensure fairness in prices being charged, particularly during these economically depressed times such as COVID? Or do we just simply take CUC's words, word for it? Mr. Chairman, through to Emily Austin, I can assure you that in our sector, CUC does not get away with anything. The, all of the information that they supply to us is heavily scrutinized. One of the things that we did when we heard that there was some mumbling about the fuel factor not being passed through the consumers, we did an audit of a sampling of CUC bills to ensure that these costs, whatever savings that CUC was recognizing from the fuel price drop were actually being passed through the consumers. And true to form, it turned out that they were. One of the other things that we've done from as far back as, as the ERA days, and I was a member of the ERA board, is that there was a fuel hedging mechanism that was put in place to ensure that the cost of fuels was minimized. I have been in touch with the CUC over the past three weeks with regards to current fuel prices and how we can look at hedging the future prices for consumers again. And that is currently being explored, and I'm waiting on CUC to revert to us with what the cost would be for hedging these fuel prices so that consumers can benefit from the current low prices of oil or and, and for, for future periods. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witness for his answer. Uh, I just want to, again, make a brief observation before moving on. Unlike a great many persons in the Cayman Islands public domain who during the last three months have been in lockdown with themselves, their family, homeschooling, etc. Many of the members, if not all of the members of the Legislative <laughs> Assembly, including particular members of this government, um, have still gone to work every single day for the last four months, if not working more so, more hours than previously. Yet, neither my March, April, or May utility bill at home has decreased by any margin that would otherwise represent the significant drops in prices of fuel. So I would just simply add that whilst usage 
for a great many in our populace may have gone up and therefore masked any discount in price for the utility provided by CUC. That formula is flawed because certainly I should have at least seen a decrease in my bill um, when I'm absent from my home 14 out of the 24 hours of every single day and everything is off. So I would simply say to the witness that sampling of a few of CUC bills, in my opinion, in the great opinion of a great many people, isn't enough. But as you stated, perhaps you're doing other things. What can you say you are doing on the subject of energy to progress the government's agenda on renewable energy? or the license agreement with Cayman Water Company, which, as we heard earlier on from the chairman of the board, has been languishing for over 10 years. Mr. Chairman, through you to Emily Austin, I, I, I just wanted to add first that there is a lag between oil price drops in the larger developed countries and what happens here purely because of the delivery delays that occur. But uh, I just wanted to let you know that uh, we did an assessment and since March we have seen the average residential consumer bill who consumes 1,000 kilowatts per month has dropped from $240 to $199. And that will continue to drop because of the fuel factor. And no two residential bills or, or even commercial bills will be the same. We could be staying in the same apartment complex, but our uses habits are different. And this is not just evident here in the Cayman Islands. Bermuda reported it, Bahamas has reported it, Florida Power and Light Company, which is a good analog to use, have shown the same thing. And, and we did an, a further analysis, and I have a graph here that shows how the consumer consumption pattern has changed purely from staying at, the, at home, working at home, et cetera. I will, I will turn to your question about um, the water bill, the, sorry, the, the um, negotiations with Cayman Water Company. One of the things that I have to make clear is that Offreg inherited this from the Water Authority. That negotiation had been going on for nine years previously and was not concluded. I joined the negotiating team in November 2017, and we have been having active discussions with Cayman Water Company since then. We have reached the point where the licensing and the contents of the license and most of the terms and conditions, we, we are in agreement with a few of those, and, and, but there are a few outstanding items that still have to be uh, sorted out. We, for instance, we are not satisfied with the, the rate of return. And one of the things that we have done, and it's actually taken place now, we, we actually uh, are conducting a cost of service study to see what it actually costs came out water company that produce water, and if that is truly representative of what they're charging consumers. That study we, we hope will be commenced within August and will take about two months to, to complete. Once that is complete, we will have a better idea of, of what the rate mechanism of Cayman Water Company should be. And then we can go back and resume negotiations with them with regards to closing the gap where we differ on, on rates and where we differ on rates of return and other terms and conditions of that license. Thank you to the witness. Just to follow on to that evidence that you gave, 
Do you have been responsible for the energy and utility sector since 2017? That's three years on. What can you say in, and I, I, I accept that certainly the negotiation with the Cayman Water Company existed prior to your arrival, but how can you state that you have, oh, sorry, how have you progressed that license agreement over the course of three years? Or is it your testimony that it has taken off reg and specifically the energy and utility sector three years to achieve feedback on reports that have been submitted to the supplier to determine fair price. I mean, what takes three years and we still have no license agreement? Surely the, the, the shareholders of Cayman Water Company are at risk when their company is providing a service without a license agreement. And certainly the consumers of the Cayman Islands are at risk in terms of future pricing in the absence of a license agreement that will hold them to any sort of committed price or certainly committed price increases similar to what we see in the utility sector of CUC. Mr. Chairman, through you to Ms. Emily Austin. It has not been three years. As I said earlier, I only joined the negotiating team in November 2017. And so when December rolls around, there was a lot of things that, that did not get addressed either from their side or from our side. And so what have we accomplished with our team thus far? We have agreed on a mechanism that allows whatever savings that CWCCs, they, they share with consumers. That did not happen in, in the previous negotiations. We have come to an agreement on most of the terms and conditions of the license. And like I mentioned earlier, there are about five to six different areas of where we are at variance. And those have to be closed before the, the uh, proper license has been granted. And to say that, that they are operating without a license is not correct. <laughs> the license extension that they had expired on 31st of December 2018, we have competent legal advice that says that they are currently operating at a license at will, which is under the auspices of, of, of right, my virtue of my having responsibility for that sector. And one of the other things that we did while this license negotiation has been going on is there was a water rate increase that CWC wanted to do and we refused it. And so we are looking out for the best interests of consumers, and that is why we, we don't feel compelled to rush into a license agreement that is not going to be beneficial to consumers at the end of the day. Thank you again, uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, for the witness and his response. Earlier, the witness gave testimony, testimony that the URC law was created using the UK law as a guide when he defended the participation of the executive director for energy and utilities being a non-voting member on the board. I would first merely observe that the UK is a population of 67 million with a much broader consumer base and a even more broader utility base as compared to the Cayman Islands with a population of 65,000 um, in terms of the board makeup, and therefore, really, we're not comparing apples to apples. But I wonder if the, mem the witness through you, Mr. Chairman, can state to this committee, what role does the witness play in board meetings? 
Mr. Chairman, through to Emily Austin. Uh, first of all, I'd like to correct that I did not say that off-reg was for, uh, formatted off the UK law. I said it was a model that was looked at and, and followed with regards to regulation. In my role as on the board, and, and I participate in, in board decisions, I bring to the board our recommendations of any matters the CUC brings to us that needs board approval and we'll have discussions about that. I, I also bring the same things from the water sector. I will contribute to other matters that the board has on the agenda and is discussing. And one of the things that I have gone at length to try and clarify is that even though the law says that we're primary advisors to the, the board in our capacity, but we're still directors of the board, and the director of the board is at will to contribute to any discussion or any matter that comes before the board. And so we participate in, in matters of the board and advise the board if a decision that they're taking is not in the best interest of consumers. Just a follow on. We were told that the participation of the executive directors, which there are three of them, as non-voting members on the board, was specifically and reservedly restricted to providing technical advice with regard to your specific sector. At no time today, and the two witnesses prior, has any evidence been given to this committee that the executive directors provide other services to the board outside of providing technical advice in your specific sector. And I would again ask you, outside of the technical advice to your specific sector, would, just, would it be true to say that you offer no intrinsic value to the board otherwise? And if I'm wrong, perhaps you can identify what those other intrinsic values are specifically. Mr. Chairman, through you to Emily Austin. If you were to look at any corporate governance model or even, even public sector and private sector, and you look at the definition of a director of a board, it, talks, it tells you that the director is involved in the decisions of the board. And so <laughs> I, I just wanted to, to clarify that misconception because as a director of the board, not only am I non-voting, but you and, and the other MLAs in here and people who have served an executive council are quite aware that any decision made by the board members of the board, we are bound by collective responsibility for those decisions. And therefore, I think it would be remiss of me as a director not to contribute to discussions and see that good governance is followed by contributing to discussions that are, that are dealing with other issues that uh, come before the board. We are recused and, and, and the board governance principle that we follow ensure that. In a matter that comes before the board that deals with any of us personally, we are automatically recused. And, and we will announce right up front in the agenda if there's any conflict of interest that arises inside that agenda for the day. And so matters that, that may be on the agenda that warrants discussion and, and seeks input from, from different, six dif different views, those are what we, we contribute to. Thank you again to the witness for his response, but if I may respectfully correct him, as was identified in the Auditor General's report the construct of the present off-reg board with the inclusion of three executive non-voting members 
is quite unusual in this jurisdiction. It may be found in larger jurisdictions, as I mentioned earlier on, the UK 67 million compared to the Cayman Islands population 65,000. But there is no other board in the Cayman Islands that is of a statutory authority or government-owned company that allows the executive directors to sit as regular board members. And again, I draw your attention to page two and three of the Office of the Auditor General report, which it is stated that surely one of the unique characteristics of Offreg is that both the CEO and executive directors are members of the board, which is an unusual arrangement. In most other boards of statutory authorities and government companies, the CEO is the only executive who is a regular non-voting member of the board, and other senior managers are invited to attend board meetings as necessary. It goes on to state that the traditional roles and responsibilities of non-executive board members and senior management is blurred in the Offreg sense. So Offreg's construct is quite different than any other board that exists in the Cayman Islands. I just point that out as a matter of fact. Just a final question, Mr. Chairman, through you to the witness. Um, in terms of strategic planning, the Office of the Auditor General report stated in paragraph 70, which is found on page 29, and I quote, it is good practice for an organization to have a strategic plan to help direct its activities. To this end, it went on to state in paragraph 71, also found on page 29, and I quote, that Offreg prepared its first strategic plan in 2017 for the period of 2018 to 2022. Certainly, naturally, this would have included the government's expectations or policy guidance. Can you state for the record what key performance indicators and outputs were required for your sector during these last three years since you took over the post in 2017? And what progress, if any, has been achieved during this time? And how would you measure success in the energy and utilities sector in regular practice? Mr. Chairman, through you to Emily Austin Harris. The first, I'll, I'll make my final comment about board composition because I think there is a, the Bahamas has a similar board. And, and so if you were gonna compare apples to apples, then you should compare regulator versus regulator. I will leave it at that point. The five years of your plan I was not part of that. When I joined Offreg first as a member of the board, that five-year strategic plan had already been started. And so I had no input to that plan. However, the, the Auditor General has specified that it does not have uh, specific KPIs within it. And uh, you ask, well, how do I measure success in the energy and utility sector. Well, rather than sit on our hands, we looked at what we could do in the energy and utility sector, and we developed what I call KPIs to, to measure CUC's performance. One of the things that was the outcome of that was how do we keep a better lid on the outages that consumers are experiences. And what we did was the, was the real-time outage reporting system. We also measured success by how quickly would we respond to CUC's requests for changes in, in, in their capital investment plan. What kind of turnaround time would we do on the capital investment plan that they submit? which is required to be submitted over five years. It, the first iteration comes before us in November. We looked at doing a 60-day turnaround on that, 
and I'm pleased to say that most of the times we have, and unless we, we didn't get information from CUC in a timely fashion, that may have extended beyond the 90 days. I also want to talk about some of the accomplishments that we did in the energy and utility sector for the period from 2017 up to 2019. Sorry, if you're about to read from the list of accomplishments, we have it already, no need to, we have it as a matter of record. I just want to state, just in conclusion, um, certainly again, going back to the board point, I'm sorry to belabor the point, Mr. Chairman, but it's been a day of correction. SEMA is a regulator. Civil Aviation Authority is a regulator. The Department of Labor and Pensions is a regulator. The Maritime Authority of the Cayman Islands is a regulator. None of these regulatory, regulatory bodies operate under the same construct that Offreg does. Within this jurisdiction, the member again gave the example of the Bahamas, and again I use the English language, this jurisdiction, the Cayman Islands, which includes Grand Cayman, Cayman Brac, and Little Cayman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair, through you. Who at Offreg approves uh, CUC to offset their cost of alternative energy that typically is owned by account holders that are quite wealthy? Mr. Chairman, through you to Emily Bernard Bush. The ERA board back in 2011, I believe, in conjunction with CUC, started a customer-owned renewable energy program as a means of incentivizing and sti stimulating the introductions of renewables on the grid. And they followed what has been good practice because the early adoption models showed that you needed to pay consumers or the people who install these systems a rate above the normal rate that CUC would pay for diesel. Over a period of time, that rate has been constantly reduced, and as it currently stands, it is still above the cost of fuel, but it's something that we're looking at very carefully. And as a matter of fact, we've also done a consultation paper with regards as to how are we going to allow these fees or, or the rate paid for customer generated energy in the future. And that paper will be coming out fairly shortly. And I can say that one of the things we're seriously considering that we will not be about the avoided costs or the levelized costs of energy. In other words, what CUZ currently pays. Um, Mr. Chairman, through you. Can you, so who approves this? Mr. Chairman, through you to MLA Bush. The, the board, the previous boards approved it. Okay, and they, through you Mr. Chairman, the, on our bill, the renewable costs uh, th there's a renewable cost on people's bills. What does that represent? Mr. Chairman, through you, that represents the cost that CUC currently pays to consumers for that energy that they purchase from them, as well as the cost that they pay to the, the five megawatt utility scale plant in Borden Town. Um, Okay, Mr. Um, to, to, uh, when you talked earlier about your analysis of CUC fuel costs, in 2011, in, in an article in the Compass, CUC identified three um, cost areas 
to make up the total fuel costs. The, the original price that they pay to the fuel company uh, before it arrives, 22 cents per gallon to cover shipping and port authority fees, storage and handling, and another 75 cents per gallon for government duty to get up to the $4 that they paid. Are they still submitting their fuel costs to you in this kind of breakdown? For instance, we know that the um, government duty has been reduced now from 75 cents to 25 cents since that. But do you still get that kind of breakdown from them or do you have to generate that breakdown yourself? Mr. Chairman, we do. They have to report these costs to us on a monthly basis and quarterly basis. So we, we have a good handle of what they have to do. Okay. Um, we were told this morning that um, JP Morgan did a succession plan which the board approved. Are, are you aware of that succession plan? Mr. Chairman, no, I'm, I'm not aware of it. But you're a board member. Yes, I am a board member, but I would imagine if that identified who the successors of him would be, um, he would probably not want us to be privy to that or at some point in time would come in and discuss it with us, but I did not see that. Okay. So that would have been decided by the board in the absence of the executive directors? Mr. Chairman, I would hazard a guess to say probably yes. Okay. Um, there was a period of time where there was a rotating um, acting CEO. Was that a board decision and were you part of that decision and, and can you give us some insight into what was the purpose of that rotation of, of, of CEOs and whether that was possibly leaked to some kind of succession plan? Mr. Chairman, when this decision was made by the board because both myself and, and Mr. Monroe were identified as as acting CEOs, we quite rightly were recused from the meeting. And the acting started with Mr. Monroe, who acted until November 2018 and, and went on vacation after that. After that, I was appointed as acting CEO at the time. The, I would, I'm not privy that the, the, there was any discussion as that this was preparation for us to fill the role because when the role became vacant, bo both of us applied for it and were interviewed for the position. Did you receive any kind of performance appraisal on the period of time that you acted as, as CEO? No, Mr. Chairman. So, I guess my question is, was it just a way of filling a position or there doesn't seem to be any rationale of, of having, or were you only appointed as acting CEO because Mr. Monroe needed to go on vacation? Mr. Chairman, after the first CEO, uh, term ended, it was recognized that the board needed to appoint an acting CEO while they recruited a new one. And, and so the decision was made to, I, like I said, I was not privy to the decision, but to appoint acting CEOs out of the executive directors at that point in time. And it was one of two. Uh, no, Mr. Two. Ali was not, was not one of those that acted. No, he was subsequently appointed acting. And to your knowledge, I would assume, would you say it is fair to assume that if you did not receive the performance appraisal, none of the others received a performance appraisal? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I can't. I, Categorical, I say. No, no. That, that's my spec. But, um, and, and you, said, you say you applied 
for the position of CEO. Um, did you reference a period by which you were acting CEO uh, uh, as part of your application or? Mr. Chairman, no, not specifically. I reference my 30 years of experience in, in Cape and Wireless. I reference my breadth of experience in, in different areas, anywhere from management consulting, banking. Uh, I reference that I have full and, and knowledge and familiarity with three of the sectors that that off reg regulates. The, the only one that I was not fully up to speed with would have been the fuel sector, and that, and that was because the fuel sector was previously an arm of the civil service. I guess my other curiosity is Mr. Monroe was a fuel inspector, and yourself and um, Ali represented two of the entities, were, were head of the two of the entities prior to the, the amalgamation of, of Havre, because you were involved with the electrical sector prior to the amalgamation, right? Mr. Chairman, I was a, a member of the board of the ERA. All right. And I also referenced that as part of my application. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to Mr. Anderson, earlier I'd mentioned that rate increases that CUC would have to, um, and the rate increase that CUC has to um, put through has to be approved by Offreg. Can you explain to this committee and to the wider public what would trigger or what would be the reasons why CUC would actually ask for a rate increase? Thank you. Mr. Chairman, to you, to Emily Saunders. As I mentioned previously, uh, the CUC is, is well regulated, and one of the th conditions in, in their transmission and distribution license talks about the mechanism by which they apply for rate increase. And so it, it says in, in June of each year that they would Support, uh, submit an application to us for rate increase based on a formula that's contained therein that looks at both the U.S. PPI as well as the, the Cayman Islands Consumer Price Index. That is submitted to us and we evaluate it. We, we check that the, the calculations are correct and we will present to the board what our findings are, and then it's up to the decision to the board to approve or disapprove it. Because the URC law categorically states that that uh, one of the powers of, of reg is to approve or disapprove uh, rate applications that are submitted to it. Sir, I just want to drill into the genesis of the rate increase itself. Um, is it? In the old CUC agreement pre-2008, there was a guaranteed <coughs> sorry, excuse me, rate of return, I think of 15% or something like that, that they were basically guaranteed. And post-2008, there were some changes that were made to the license, which resulted also in the, um, the fuel pasture and everything, which prior to the 2008 license wasn't necessarily there. I'm just trying to understand the components of what would drive CUC, like what is it that they have to make or what is it that they are guaranteed to make that would justify a price increase? Mr. Chairman, uh, subsequent to the 2008 license that was signed, CUC is not guaranteed a return. It, there's a rate cap adjustment mechanism that is in that license, the transmission and distribution license, that talks about a band within that where CUC is expected to perform and, and a rate of return would be expected based on capital investment, 
their rate base. Um, certain factors call an X factor that looks at socioeconomic market conditions. And, and all of those are components of, of this rate increase. I am pleased to say that when we did an examination of what CUC's return has been since the 2008 license was signed, it's averaged 7.4 percent. If you take that in comparison, and, and I know the comment may come about we're looking at bigger jurisdictions again, but what analog are you going to use but look at what is happening elsewhere? And the public utility commissions in the U.S., the average rate of return that they have granted to any, any utility provider has been 8%, uh, never more than 10%, mainly averaging around 8.2%. Earlier said rate base, I'm trying to understand what makes a rate base, what goes into the rate base. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I mean, understand what drives it, because ultimately the question or the issue in all of this is then, what incentive does CUC have to reduce costs, reduce expenses, or reduce anything? I'm, I'm trying to understand what is built in there that will incentivize them as opposed to the, the current situation that we have. Mr. Chairman, to you, to Emily Saunders. So, uh, so you see regulate, so rates are regulated by number one, income, the rate base, the return on rate base, the X factor that I mentioned about in the US and Cayman Islands CPI. The rate cap adjustment mechanism that I mentioned there earlier is, is a mechanism to ensure that CUC is efficient with its capital investments. And so it's no longer enabled to earn a fixed return. And so there's no incentive to them to pad their investments. In fact, if they overspend, then they won't be able to meet their dividend policy for starters. Uh, which would in turn affect their share value, and more importantly, their credit weight. And, and so CUC's returns are regulated by this rate cap adjustment mechanism, and that forces them to manage and cut their costs, but not at the expense of compromising the reliability and stability of the grid and, and their performance standards. And one of the things that we also do with regards to regulating them, there are very strict performance standards enshrined in that license agreement that penalizes them for underperformance or may reward them for overperformance. And they have been penalized in the past for underperformance. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how our CAM and all of that fits into this entire process. Let me kind of backtrack and tell you what I'm trying to get at so we're clear. One of the issues that I have, um, and this is a broader legislative issue, not just at the public accounts committee level, is that when questions are asked of the, the, the area of governance, and in some cases I would even say, I would use as an example, we'll ask, um, a question on, say, the HSA or something. Then the person who would actually would give testimony would be pretty much a member of the HSA. Well, sorry. The person who would give the advice or the answer sometimes is a very person from the HSA. And what my issue has always been is that the ministry is buying a service, the HSA is selling the service. And we just need comfort that the ministry and as using, like I say, as an example, we just need comfort that the ministry is knowing what they're buying because the HSA sure knows what they're selling. And what we're trying to understand here and what I'm trying to get at is in terms of the overall off reg, and, and this is something why when we chose to invite all the executive directors, and this is something that's gonna be coming for everyone, is for them to explain to us fully what goes into their thought process in terms of regulate? Because I can tell you, I've gone through the license, I've looked at both of them, and it is complicated, it is complex. And what I'm looking for is a kind of comfort level 
that offreg, the board, its members and everyone is aware of what goes inside because, I mean, I've already broken it down to a point where I can understand it, but I want for something where the public can understand what it is that offreg is looking at because when you talk about the race, rate base and included in that rate base, I'm assuming is um, power generation expenses. But then when you factor in that power generation expenses, which can go anywhere from 69 to 79% of the total expenses of CUC in any given year, and that is included in it, and that is primarily driven by even fuel, then it comes back to the issue now of where or what it is that CUC is doing to make sure that the largest part of their expense, which is power generation, is something that they're looking at. And this goes back then to the conversation I had with Maliki at the time, concerning, sorry, the CEO at the time, is what was CUC doing to ensure that that cost, which also factors into whether or not, because at the end of the day, if CUC makes a certain amount of money, they're fine, no rate increase. If they don't make a certain amount of money, then they apply for actually a rate increase. And what I'm trying to understand or get to is those expenses that goes into the rate base. Now, what it is that we can do or what is it that Offreg is doing to monitor those expenses within the race base to make sure that we are basically getting our CUC is actually going out to make sure they're getting the best value for money. Because at the end of the day, from looking at the contract, I couldn't find the incentive for, C no, and like I say, it could be there. I just couldn't find it. The incentive for CUC to go out other than the fact that we are glad that some of them choose to do a very good job and I've said it publicly in terms of where they fall within their industry. But I'm just trying to understand the culture in terms of offering, like all those expenses are monitored, especially when it comes on to power generation, which deals with a lot of oil, the lubricants and everything else. That's what I'm trying to, to, to get at. And, and then so the public can understand because one of the things that people also don't realize is that CUC also charge, not just for the use, CUC actually charge for the generation of the entire power. So it is in the public interest for CUC to become actually quite efficient. So if you have a capacity where you need a million um, 900 megawatts and CUC is producing a million, sorry, 900,000 versus a million, that 100,000 that is also generated is also shared amongst the, the, the consumers based on a percentage of what it is that they use. And it is that the relationship between the generation versus um, what it is that is actually being used, I'm trying to, 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 to understand. And that is what I'm looking comfort from, from the regulators, that that is a relationship that they also understand because you mentioned the X factor, but there's also the Z factor too. And so that is really what I'm looking for, is that level of comfort that all of the different makeup that goes into the rate adjustment and everything else, for the public can understand or take comfort that all of those things are being looked at. I understand it's very technical, but that's the comfort level I'm looking for right now. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, through you to Emily Saunders, I hope I can provide the correct answer for that. Yes, one of the things that we actually monitor is the efficiency of the generators which they run because one of the things that we specify that they should be run at their most optimum efficiency so that the less fuel is burned at that point in time. We also stipulate that they should dispatch the most efficient generators. CUC has, I think, if I'm not mistaken, up to 25 generators ranging from older ones right up to the ones that were put in in 2014. And we stipulate that when you are generating power, the most efficient generators, I, which are the ones with burn the less fuel, must be the ones that you put online. And, and so we monitor, we, they have to submit fuel efficiency plans to us. They have to submit a fuel monitoring plan to us they have to submit their their costs purchasing renewables to us and so any cost that would be passed through to consumers whether it's a fuel cost or whether it's a generation cost is heavily scrutinized by by us to ensure that CUC does not overcharge consumers 
and you also talk about rate-based vote. This is where, this is why we pay special attention to the capital investment plans that they submit. And, uh, and if they submit a capital investment plan that we believe that is not in the best interest of consumers, then we don't take to the board. We, we will tell them we, we don't agree with, with, with what you've submitted here. It's not in the best interest of consumers. And therefore, that does not pass the gate. I, I hope I've answered your question. Um, let me put it in a different way. I have here the company of statistics um, that is done by the Economics and Statistics Office. And this is the one up to 2018, and I'm on page 186, just to put what I'm saying in context. On that page, it gives you the year, it gives you the capacity, it gives you the production, and then it gives you the consumption. So for us to look, say, at 2010, um, the total consumption was 552,593, and the total production was 605,119. So in terms of a relationship between consumption and production, that was 91%. I look at 2018, the total consumption was 628,822, and the total production was 641,800. So in essence, that was 98%. So in other words, like I said, looking at the factors, and I've said it publicly, it's an efficiently run company. I mean, you're producing 98% of what is being used, I compared industrial standards and seen where they're coming from historically, and that report goes all the way back to 1996. I can see over the years where they have actually improved the relationship between what is actually consumed versus actually what is actually produced. So at 98%, I really have no complaints. I, I, I must say that for the record. The issue is that 2% difference in terms of the non-consumption because it is actually generated, and this is when people look at the side of their light bills, and they will see down the bottom, as I was explaining it there. You have a little bar, you, Bill here, Mr. Chairman, just for a second. Where you will look, and you will see um, on the summary, there are some numbers right after each before there's a dollar figure, and this bill is 108, 108, 108, 108. It is my understanding that that 108 is pretty much the other part now that is actually used to allocate the 2% that is actually not used based on the overall usage. So in essence, when you start looking at it, we're still paying not just for what we use, but also for what is generated that we didn't use, and that is apportioned to us as a percentage of our bill. I, I wish to God mine was this low, sorry. Um, mine is like 4,000 something that I get hit with. But from that standpoint, so before, in 2010, 9% of what wasn't being consumed was actually what was distributed to everyone else, because we have, someone has to pay for it, it pours out there, they have generated, the cost has to be paid. And it is based as a percentage, if I use 1%, I pay 1% of whatever that amount is. No, so I said before, it's an efficiently run company. When I start getting down now, into understanding how their expenses or how their adjustments is made is a combination of the RCAM plus, in essence, a certain amount of expenses that goes into the generation of the, um, the fuel. So they have a set return on their assets, which is what the RCAM look at, and then there's the non, or the, where I say fixed cost to some extent, then there's the non-fixed cost expenses. It is that non-fixed cost expense because that one is already set and you manage that by allowing them to agree or disagree what assets they add to it. I've gone through 10 years of their balance sheet and I've directly can see which year assets went up versus which year assets go down. And you can go through the annual statements and they will tell you what assets they buy. I don't need to ask those questions, they're already in the public domain. But then there is the non-fixed cost, the administrative, well, the administrative or the, the other costs. And it is those costs that for me is really the biggest problem because when you look at CUC's bill in terms of their, sorry, financial statements, their biggest line of expense is still power generation and that is driven by fuel. And that is part that goes actually into their other rate base. And my issue is, considering the issue that we have with fuel, which I've already indicated that 
you don't regulate the fuel factor part of the bill, but there's still the largest part of CUC expense is still fuel. The fuel still comes back to bite us, not once in the fuel factor pass-through, but also twice in their generation, which goes into the rate base. And that is the issue now where I'm trying to understand what CUC does separately to reduce that power generation cost, because that ultimately will be the cost. If they reduce that, then it basically means, and they're meeting the targets that they have, it means that they wouldn't be coming to anyone for any rate increases or anything. And so my question in all of that is, what is being done, because fuel seems to be a runaway issue right now, what is being done to incentivize CUC? Because again, as you said, um, in the next bills coming up, maybe CUC went out and find a way to get a benefit from those, um, the cheap fuel that is out there. If that is the case, then is the same benefit also on the fuel factor? I mean, how are these relationships going? And that's what I'm trying to understand here. That's what I'm trying to say, what is being looked at, how that process is being managed, how that is being monitored. Because at the end of the day, even if you add on the government fuel, sorry, the government duty, transportation, and you look at what Platts prices were in, in the Gulf in March and April compared to what I'm waiting on right now, I can assure you, looking at my own analysis that I've done, that the cost that we're paying in, in, in terms of the fuel factor is even higher in some years than what retail prices was in the U.S. And you, you're talking about people buying in the wholesale market. And that is really where I am very uncomfortable with. It is that fuel price that CUC is paying and also the fuel factor that's being passed through. And that is the part that I really and truly believe that yourself, as um, regulating that part of the bill that deals with power generation and Mr. Monroe that deals with fuel, need to put it, the other heads together and say, guys, what can be done to reduce this? But there's no way, and see, you've seen every one of the annual reports, put the average price of the imperial gallon for the entire year, and that's where we're able to look at it and analyze it to true. And that is really where, I'm going to use the word, the criminal part of the bill is. is this on the fuel, and it's on the power generation. And whatever it is that they pay for that fuel, the bottom line is it still goes to some extent to that rate base. Look at the RCAM, and that is where the, the, the price increase comes from. And that is what needs to really sit down and be managed is fuel. Fuel is a problem. Now, in the old bill, and this is where I can say I have my disagreement with, in the old CUC agreement where the fuel wasn't a pass-through, there was a little bit more transparency. And if I had to choose between CUC managing fuel in this country and going out to get the best price versus the other fuel companies, I will take CUC any day of the week and twice on Sundays. Because the truth of the fact is, the money that they thought CUC was actually making from fuel, it is now even way worse with what the fuel companies are doing. We are better off leaving CUC to go and go deal with this fuel issue as opposed to the arrangement we have now. And at some point, as we start looking through and reviewing some of these licenses, I think the TND license as a five-year um, renewal, the last one I think was November, 2014, so the last one should have been November 2019 from that standpoint, is that we start looking at some of these things as we start reviewing the license and looking at it too to see how we can make it more efficient. And I think that is what needs to be done. And ultimately, I think that is the comfort that the public is looking for, that something, that something is being done about this. And we're just not taking it as it is. As I said to the chairman before, this is a problem in this country that fuel is coming inside here and customs cannot tell you the value of the fuel that comes inside here because the invoices that are produced to customs are from subsidiaries that are owned by these other companies and nobody knows what the true cost is. And until we deal with that white elephant in the room, all of this will mean nothing because fuel is one of the biggest things that drive this entire high cost of living in Cayman. And I know I went off a little bit far in it, but that is really, <laughs> Mr. Anderson, what needs to be done from off-reg to add value, not just from <coughs> CUC, but also from the fuel standpoint. And until people start seeing reduction at the pump and the plug, none of these other successes, nothing means anything until the consumer feels that they get something in it. And that is really and truly the culture that we now want to see start pushing through. Like I said, my issues with CUC, and CUC can come here next week and defend themselves. CUC is the only crime is that little one line, the fuel factor on their bill that they pass through to us. And that is what we need to regulate because that part is unregulated on the bill. And that is really where I feel bad for. And if we don't deal with that, all of this means nothing. 
Mr. Chairman, to you, to Emily Saunders, I don't know if I can recollect all that you said, but I, I want to assure that there's a couple of things that are afoot, and, and you mentioned generation. We, when I, we've done a consultation about regulatory accounting rules, and what that is intended to do is to separate generation from transmission and distribution so that we have a true picture of what the actual generation costs are that CUC incurs. And so a decision will be made on that in, in due course. And that's one of the things that we've been actually pursued. The other thing is I talked about earlier conversion to alternative fuels. What is compressed con from, from petroleum, um, propane, or whether it's liquefied nitrogen, or whether it's compressed nitrogen gas. If you were to look at the prices of, of any of those components today, you would see there's a great disparity between what diesel costs are and what natural gas costs are. And when that is extrapolated over a period of 20 years, it shows very little movement in the cost of natural gas because there's so much of it. And what Offreg is actually pursuing is how soon, yes, you have 20 something generators in there that are burning diesel. The price of diesel is here. The price of natural gas is here. How soon can we bridge that gap by converting these diesel engines to natural gas? And that is something we are actively pursuing. And yes, I don't do this in isolation. I, I do talk with my, my colleague, Mr. Monroe, as to how we can get uh, this fast forwarded. One of the things we, want to, we have been actively talking about is to have a forum where all the players involved in it sit down and we discuss how we resolve this matter. But I can assure you that the Integrated Resource Plan talks about conversion to natural gas taking place in 2025. We've raised the question, why? If there's technology allowing earlier conversion, why can't we bring that forward two years? And so these are the things that, that we are looking at from off rec's perspective, and we don't, like I say, sit on our hands and, and not monitor what's going on. I know other Caribbean jurisdictions have looked at going the LNG route, and the issue that they ran into was getting a steady supply of LNG. Now, many of them was actually depending on Trinidad, and I think a couple of years back or a few years back, Trinidad, I think, had made some change in terms of the amount that they could export or et cetera, which affected other Caribbean islands who were looking for that steady LNG supply. So, I mean, the question is then, is it a situation now that we have now found a steady source of LNG? Because one of the things that you, fi you find, and you see it recently with the fracking issue, that the minute you find something to challenge the petroleum, all of a sudden prices go down to basically nothing. So we have seen where the sheiks and, and, and the, um, the, the rednecks, well, sorry, not, not that term, sorry. There was an article I remember seeing with, with those guys who were basically doing the fracking versus the, the Saudis. You know what I mean? And you, you saw what happened to the price of oil at that point, where those guys just went crazy with the price of oil, that it made it literally almost um, discouraging for anyone to basically go and continue the minute that oil is challenged. So, I mean, th those are the things, but th th one of the <coughs> biggest issues has always been getting us to the supplies of LNG. And the question is this, for this region, as we have we found someone now that can actually give us a steady supply of LNG? Got the last thing you want. You, we know we can find diesel anywhere around, but you convert to LNG, and then all of a sudden you can't get LNG or whichever gas that you're looking for, then you're back to square one. And it has always been a situation where fuel or diesel has always basically ended up dominating. And my issue is, even now, and I'm not waiting until 2025, even right now, the prices that we are paying for fuel in this country, for diesel, is still way above what it should have been. And LNG would have been a big difference in terms of savings, but I think we can get some of that savings now if we just deal with the fuel issue right now. 
All right, Reverend. Um, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, through you to Emily Saunders, answers yes. <laughs> uh, we, we have had discussions with three suppliers who have um, the infrastructure in place or set the infrastructure in place to supply LNG to the Caribbean. And, so, and they're actually pursuing the Cayman Islands because of our economic condition. Um, yeah, but, <laughs> but to the point, why can't we get it now? Well, one of the things you have to consider, and, and you will appreciate this, is that you just can't go to the licensee and say tomorrow morning you, 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 you have to consider stranded costs. And so there has to be a mechanism where those stranded costs are recovered. And, and there, that is why we're saying well, you talked about 2025. We're not satisfied with that because of developments that happen now. So, therefore, let us look at bringing it forward as far as possible. And one of the, the, the we're looking at 2022, 2023, if it's practical to to get it done. I have a question on the, the on distribution network. Right? As I understand it, the distribution network was basically paid for by the consumers due to a fee that was added after Ivan when most of the distribution network had to be replaced. That, that is correct, right? I think it was $7 a month or something like that. Mr. Chairman, there was a recovery fee paid just after Ivan, but there have been network expansions since then. Okay. At the end of the day, the consumer pays. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but here's the problem I have, and but they're allowed under their license agreement to put the distribution network on NRA road reserve property for free. We don't charge them any uh, lease for, for the property. Uh, but if they put it on somebody's private property, that person can demand a lease from the, from the company for the, the pole being on their private land. But Although we allow them that free access to the NRA road reserve, whenever the NRA has to move a light pole, CUC is allowed to charge back that, that, move, that, that, that reconfiguration of the distribution to the NRA. Um, it, can, can we do something about that? I mean, can that be offset by, uh, if they get in for free, and then you tell me now I want you to move two light poles, and you, send, you say, well, to fix this road here, there's a $37,000 cost for CUC to move these two light poles, right? And the NRA has to pay them that, that, that cost again. That, that seems to me like there seem to be a lot of double, uh, they're getting away with the public is paying, I agree the consumer is paying, but we seem to be paying all the time because we're paying, we paid for the original um, claim for the, for the stuff. When they move it now for the NRA, although they're, they're, they're getting the location free, they charge the NRA substantial costs. I mean, we're not talking here about $10 to move a light pole. We're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars. I, I can't imagine what the cost is going to be for the rerouting of the areas now around Hurley's because there's substantial stuff that has to be moved there. It, it, can the regulators do something to, 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 to offer the, 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 the consumer some kind of protection on this or, or is that just part of the license and we have to wait until the license is expired and then come up with a lease agreement per poll that will allow government to pay up to move it? Mr. Chairman, respectfully, the off-reg is constrained by what the terms and conditions are in those two licenses. The representative from Bontown West did mention earlier that the license is subject to review every five years, parts of it, and we have that schedule to be done this year. The on, I, I would 
believe that it would be up to the NRA to negotiate some kind of agreement with CUC to, to offset these costs. A, a case in point is the um, street lights, the high pressure sodium street lights. The uh, project was approved by us that it talked about replacing, I think it was over 7,000 of those, which in turn saved fuel costs and saved um, government money and NRA paid for those lights. Uh, and I mean paid for the station of the lights. The costs for the street lighting dropped because those were installed. And, and so I would think it would, it would be up to the NRA to, to sit together with CUC and perhaps subsequent to that come and have a discussion with us as to how we could approach this. I think if that part of the distribution license is being renewed now, can I invite off reg to have a conversation with the NRA as to how we can save public funds and having to move like poles when the whole great work is on government land for free. Mr. Chairman, I, I welcome that suggestion and, and we'll act on it. Questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Anderson, and we apologize for keeping you so long. I think we're about an hour and a half past the limit, but we know we got a late start. But thank you very much, and we want to thank you for your candid responses and we really enjoyed the conversation with you. The meeting is therefore adjourned until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning when we will have Mr. Duke Monroe at 10 o'clock followed by Mr. Ali Famo, and then after lunch we'll have Mr. Malik Cummins. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. <laughs>